Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 15, and we're going to be going from verse 16 all the way to 39. Mark 15, 16 to 39. Before we do that, I'll give you a little bit of a, an update on some stuff I saw this week. So, you know, mid, midweek, I, I, I kind of try to relax by, by watching something educational. I talk a lot about that um, very often. But, but this last week, like, Lauren got to choose what we were going to watch. And so I was, I was excited to see what she found. And we found this documentary um, about an ancient city. But I'd, I'd heard about this city before. It, 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 it was a word that had popped into my mind once or twice, but didn't know anything about it. But it was about this ancient city of Petra. Have you ever heard of Petra before? It's a city that's, that's carved out of the side of a mountain. It's solid rock. And, and it was part of this series about amazing architectural structures in the ancient world. And, and what I found is that some of the most amazing architectural structures of the ancient world are in these seemingly unlikely places. Not where I would build one of the most amazing structures in the world if I ever were to do it. But, but this most amazing one is this city of Petra. And it was built by the ancient Arabian desert dwellers that were known as the Nabataeans. And this city of Petra, it's, it's really fascinating for a few different reasons, as this, this documentary sort of explored. Well, the first reason is the location. This ancient city is in the middle of the desert, like the absolute middle of the desert. It was built 2,000 years ago, far from any vegetation or any natural resources. So the environment within which this ancient city is located, if you look, just look at where it is, it's, it's a place of solid sandstone cliffs and ridges and valleys. And so the surrounding landscape, it looks wind-worn and sun-scorched and hard as stone. It looks uninhabitable. I would not think to start here. The second thing is that the city of Petra, it's carved into that landscape. It's carved into the towering mountainside. The buildings, the temples, and the ornate city center, they are all carved out of the mountain just as the David was carved from a single piece of stone. So it's not as though these folks carved individual rocks and then sort of assembled them into a city. No. They looked at the mountain and said, what rock do we have to remove to reveal the city? It's all of a single piece, and they did it with hand and chisel. Archaeologists estimate that this process took the Nabataeans something like 200 years of steady labor to complete. 200 years in order to accomplish this. And one archaeologist and, and a... Um, a builder himself said the way that they did this, if they made a single mistake at any point in the process, the whole project was shot. There was no going back to fix it. They, they couldn't solve for it with the way that they were carving this stone. Nothing but pick and chisel were used to remove hundreds of thousands of pounds of sandstone over the course of this construction. Some of the columns and the colonnades are over 100 feet tall and they're perfectly aligned and perfectly smooth. But that's not it. The Nabataeans also invented an incredible aqueduct system to channel the occasional bit of rainwater from far away all the way into Petra's city center. So that means that a desert city carved out of sheer rock without a tree or a shrub or a bush in sight was equipped with enough water year-round to have something like a plumbing system, right? It's all operating in and through these carved channels in the rock. So as I watched this documentary about this city of Petra, I could not help but be in awe. I was thinking about it the next few days. How could a place so dry and so arid and so utterly devoid of the typical signs of life become the site of such flourishing? How could they have seen that in advance? How could a desert become an oasis? How could something as uninviting as desert stone 
become the very stuff of civilization and life and even luxury? Well, the answer was in the creative power of these ancient Nabataeans. They had the capacity to take something as merciless as desert stone and turn it into a majestic source of awe that still stands perfectly preserved 2,000 years later. And if you're like me, the things that, that most bring a sense of awe in life are exactly these kinds of great inversions, these surprising reversals. Um, I see them more and more often. They're, they're really these beloved paradoxes, and much of the Bible works on them. As we step into the text this morning, we're going to see the deepest paradox of all, the most surprising reversal, and the greatest inversion that's ever been accomplished. That's where we're going to be. In Mark 15, 16 to 39, we're going to allow the, the eyes of the heart to settle upon the tortured, crucified form of the one who will bring hope out of hurting and who will bring the water of life from the hard rock of his stricken and cursed personal fate. So as we look at Christ upon the cross in these verses in, in Mark 15, 16 to 39, we must first of all see how the cross is the place of deepest failure according to mankind or according to, to our estimation of things. That's, that's the hard rock that we're going to see. And yet, we will see how the cross is also simultaneously the place of deepest fulfillment according to God. So, failure according to man, but fulfillment according to God. And finally, we're going to consider together what it means for us to stop and to stare at the sun, to, to behold this beloved paradox. And we'll read Mark 15, 16 to 39 as we do so. We'll do it one-handed. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them, to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saves others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it, they said, 
Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled up a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. The word of the Lord. Well, surely this is a scene we know, right? We've been working toward this scene for a year. We've been pushing to this moment. And if we're Christians, the crucifixion, it looms large in every part of how we think about our faith. We use that phrase all the time, carrying a cross. And rightly so. It's important that the crucifixion would be the, really the central animating principle of how we understand our Christian faith, the crucifixion and the resurrection. However, I think there are important insights that we don't always pay attention to about this particular moment in human history. As a preacher, as I approach this text this week, there, the question is, what do, you, what do you leave out, right? Everything comes true in one moment. So what is it that you actually focus on trying to say? Well, this morning, I, I want to investigate the cross with you by talking about how the cross displays three core human fears all at once, right? Three core human fears, and how those fears lead us to see the cross as the place of deepest human failure. The three fears that lead us to see the cross as the place of deepest human failure. And surely the, the first step for the Nabataeans, those people who built Petra, on their way to, to bringing that city out from the rock, was to admit the obvious. The land is dry, right? The rock is hard. The site is barren. And this is definitively not a good thing that we are beholding this morning. In the same way, as we look at the cross, we must not look past it. This is a great temptation in my own life to kind of say, I get it, I know, I'm looking past it, on to the next thing. But we must see it in all of its obvious and its incontrovertible terror and roughness and human failure. We have to stop and behold it. The first way in which we see the cross of Jesus as a place of failure according to mankind, a place where human fears are realized, is through the first core fear, which is the reality of shame. The reality of shame, the fear of shame. Jesus, in this moment, as he hangs bleeding and naked on this tree, on this crucifix, is being shamed. We can't look past that. That was part of the punishment. And what is shame, really? Sitting this week trying to inhabit this fear and to, to search it out. Why is shame one of the core human fears? Well, shame is social pain. It's what other people can do to, to injure our sense of ourselves in social context. Shame is social pain. Though we sometimes laugh when we hear terms um, like cancel culture, we all know the real fear of being humiliated before our peers or our family or our wider society and especially our own religious community. I mean, just for context, I was, I was listening to a podcast yesterday and it was about a guy from a band, a really famous band, who experienced two sides of the public shaming culture that exists. He got sort of shamed from the left and then he got shamed from the right and he got shamed from the left again. And he was bouncing back and forth <laughs> between um, this, this now ritualized experience of, of, of experiencing online public shaming. And it was a long interview where he talked about how strange it was to go through that. But it happens, it happens in many different contexts. Some of the ugliest parts of human society, the most damaging 
to the soul, they come from this ritualized shaming. And such practices, that they happen in, in every culture. I could hear the pain in this musician's voice as he talked about the consequences in his life for this ritualized shaming that he had been through, the impact it had had on his fellow bandmates, on his friends, on his family. And he said, I, he said, I can take it. I, I can take essentially whatever the, the internet were to throw at me for whatever I did, but what I couldn't take is what the impact was upon the people who were associated with me. And that's why I'm having to distance myself from my band because I love my band and I don't want them to bear any of my shame. That's how powerful this was. He walked away from his life's work to try to prevent shame from infecting and hurting the people that he loved. It's an incredibly powerful reality in our lives. And if we're honest, some of our deepest motivations and fears are all about avoiding the prospect of such overwhelming social pain. I had to be honest, this, this plays a role if I'm looking directly at it. Shame so injures the human heart that it can lead to lives of, of huddled desperation if it is internalized, a paralysis that if it is internalized, right? A, an unwillingness to, to live as you feel called to live for fear of public shame. But shame can also lead to violent rage if it is externalized. So if you take it inside, it can shut you down. If you externalize it, it can produce uh, incredible violent rage. We see that some of the, the, the worst atrocities that are committed in our day are, come from somebody who was shamed and then eventually snapped and externalized that social pain back out onto society. This is some of the most potent fear um, in, in our lives as human beings. Social pain can drive us to drink, to act out, to deflate, or even to explode. When we see Jesus stripped naked and nailed to a tree to suffocate in public, we must not miss the degree to which social pain was a large part of this torture. That was part of the point. He was put up there in order to be mocked. And we see that even his approach to the cross went through a, a process of public mockery where these guards dress him up and then dress him down. Social pain. And not only was Jesus mocked and shamed, but he was, of course, murdered. The fear of social pain is outdone by another fear, another core fear that we all experience and it's that core fe fear that we all share of physical destruction. Physical destruction. If, if there's something that we fear more than alienation from others, which is shame, it's alienation from ourselves, from our own bodies in death. As far as we know and what Scripture teaches, to die is to be separated from our physical bodies. That material reality that we experience as the physical extension of ourselves. And this sort of dislocation, it was never God's intention. And so, we fear it deeply. But in many ways, we fear death is the, the end of our story, the end of us. That's, that's what we think about when we think about it. So, there, we, we, do, we therefore do all that we can to preserve and to extend our physical lives in the body. Even as we are aware that physical death is a certainty, and all of us are, this does not reduce the fear that we tend to feel when we contemplate it. When we see Jesus facing not just any death from entropy or age or illness, but a violent theft of his own life through murder, surely our hearts quiver. My heart quivered this week as I stared at this. So these two core human fears, social pain, shame, and physical destruction, death, are the ones that we typically think about when we're prompted by the cross. If you're to sit down and contemplate the cross, uh, I, I found that I could arrive at these two rather quickly. But there is a third fear that is more terrible 
and deeper than even these two we see on the cross. And it's the fear of forsakenness. What we're referring to here is the reality of psychological or existential terror captured in Jesus' cry. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They preserved it in the, you know, the original Aramaic there so that it was just such a surprising thing to hear him say. They kept it. Translated into English, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The deepest human fear of all is one that we may never have faced up to or acknowledged. As I was sitting in my office this week, I realized I hadn't faced up to this fear in my own life. I spoke to a psychiatrist recently about his, his decades of experience uh, in clinical practice, and I, I asked him what mental dis-ease and spiritual dis-ease is all about. I said, in your, you know, in your many years, what is it that you're doing when you're working with people? And his answer was immediate. He looked at me and he said, rejection. Rejection. At heart, the deepest human fear has to do with this idea. I will call out and I will be rejected. I'll be alone. One noted psychologist famously said, the opposite of love is not hatred, it is indifference. So Jesus has been shamed, he has been murdered, and now, or he's being murdered, and now he cries out to the Father that he's always known and who has always been there with him, and he finds that he is forsaken. In this moment, the cries of Jesus are not answered. And so this is what I take away from this. As human beings, our core fears are summed up at the cross. Shame, death, abandonment, all our worst nightmares are encapsulated into a single scene. The fear of shame, that everyone will point the finger at us, find us out, or mock us, it's behind so many of our actions. The fear of death, that the one thing we experience as unquestionably real, our own body, could one day let us down. It's too much for many of us to contemplate for very long. And finally, the deepest fear of all is that of rejection, of isolation, or of abandonment. Worse than shame or death is the fear we experience in the haunting silence where we expected a response. And yet, the stone mountains of the Arabian desert contained so much more than these harsh and terrible facts. Within that rock, even in and through the use of it, the Nabataeans saw a city that was waiting to be released, a place of flourishing to come from a place of lifelessness. At the cross, we saw three core human fears reach their nightmarish zenith. But in and through the seeming f failure according to mankind, there was simultaneously fulfillment according to God's plan. Let's take a look at the first fear that was actually a fulfillment, a fear of shame. Well, shame was in fact part of the plan in this moment. If you look at Isaiah 50, verse 6, or Isaiah 53, verse 4 to 6, you will see that, that it's prophesied that one will come who is described as the suffering servant of Yahweh. And as he comes, part of his vocation is that he will bear our shame. He will, he will take on the shame of the world and all of the guilt of the world that produces that shame. That is according to plan. All the social dislocation in the world, present because of sin, hatred of God, hatred of neighbor, it is heaped upon God's chosen servant. For some, all of life has, has been one long attempted avoidance of shame. But at the cross, all of our worst shame-based nightmares are coming true in Jesus' life and in our stead. 
according to the divine plan, all the social pain that we spend our human lives trying to avoid was channeled fully and finally back into and onto Jesus, the man who is God. Why is that important? Because as the man who is God, he absorbs it, and he's able to do away with it. Shame. It's part of the fulfillment of God's plan. But not only the core fear of shame, but the reality of death. In the text, we see that right as Jesus approaches death, darkness sets in over the whole land. Well, darkness sets in as a sign of cosmic judgment. It's not that there's some weird eclipse or some scientific, you know, perfect reason why this happens. When you see darkness fall at unnormal times in Scripture, it's a sign of cosmic judgment. You can put in the margins of your Bible Amos 5.18 in order to see this, or even more importantly, Exodus 10.21-23, the famous falling of the darkness in the midst of the plagues. So, beyond even our fear of social pain is the fear of physical destruction, of alienation from the flesh and bones that we know to be ourselves. The Bible tells us that death entered the world as the consequence and penalty for sin. So, we feel ourselves headed for the grave and we dread it, as is normal, Because in Adam, all have violated God's law and must bear the consequences of that violation, must experience death. And yet, in this moment, as the cosmic darkness falls, that penalty falls on the man who is God, one who is is truly of us is fit to bear the penalty owed to us he dies. One who is truly God is able to withstand it. He will be raised. In Jesus, all the fear and dread of death that binds human consciousness every waking hour, it gave way to a perfectly fulfilled divine plan and was overcome. You know, John says the light has come into the world and the darkness has not overcome it. Shame according to plan for the suffering servant of Yahweh is to be shamed. Death, darkness sets in as cosmic judgment, according to plan on the man who is God. And finally, forsakenness. The deepest human fear of all is felt by Jesus at the cross. The unthinkable, unbearable, psychological, and existential terror of final rejection. Jesus' quotation comes from Psalm 22, and in fact, much of this passage echoes Psalm 22. But specifically in the cry of dereliction, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What we're seeing here, it's not so much perfect dogmatic theology as it is the, the felt experience of Jesus as the cosmic darkness of judgment falls, and he loses access to the Father. Uh, Paul will go on to interpret this moment for us in in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Paul writes, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. There's that idea of substitution, Jesus' life for ours. Paul says in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And Jesus himself has hinted at it in the days before now by speaking of the cup that he will have to drink. Remember the disciples? <laughs> we'll, we, yeah, we're, we're down. Like, we can drink your cup. And he's like, no, I don't think you can. I don't think you fully understand who I am and what I'm doing and, 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 and what's coming down the pike, uh, disciples. You, you cannot drink this cup. You're not fit for it. The heinous truth. As Jesus was murdered, the Father looked on and in this moment did not deliver. Jesus loses felt access to the Father and for a moment knows Him only as my God, my God. And what's the result? 
This is beautiful. The result of this moment is that the curtain that stood as the, the means of symbolic separation between God and the world, the curtain that's in the temple, was torn from top to bottom. Because Jesus tasted separation from his Father in our stead, now all the world, and not just the priesthood of, of Israel, has access to God. Because Jesus bore our sin and experienced what it means to be God-forsaken, we no longer will. As Christians, we are those who recognize the Son of God in the middle of this heinous moment, in the middle of this bloody and God-forsaken scene of an unjust criminal execution. We recognize who and what we are really witnessing. We, like this Gentile soldier with no background um, in the story, look on this one and say, surely this man is the Son of God. All our fears and, and failures are summed up in the destiny of this Jesus in this moment. And yet, God's plan is being fulfilled to the T. To the T. I was reading the church fathers this week, and they said things like this. Just as the, the first Adam was cursed by a tree, the second Adam undoes the curse by hanging on a tree. What does that mean? It means that in the darkest moments of life and of human history, God is so good that He continues to work even in and through those moments for His glory and for our good in Christ. Where we see failure and loss and fear, God is working all things toward perfect fulfillment. He is not surprised. He is not defeated. He is not caught off guard. Therefore, a Christian has hope. We serve a God like this. And the scene closes in this curious way, which I've said already. It isn't a Jewish leader who finally recognizes him. That would have been kind of how I would end the story. The, oh, no, we accidentally killed God. We shouldn't have done it. No, that doesn't happen right? It's not them. And it isn't a disciple who hung in there who kind of pops up. Peter doesn't kick down the door and say, I'm still here. I hung on. You know, I did, I did my job. No. It's nobody from the story up until now. It isn't somebody that we know to be associated with Jesus. It isn't even somebody from the movement. It's not even really one of, one of the women, which I might have anticipated at this moment. But in fact, it's a soldier from another nation, one of the nations. So when everything happens on the cross, it's this foreign Gentile soldier who is given eyes to see that truly this man was the Son of God. I think just at a, at a canonical level, at a theological level, it's so significant that it's somebody from outside Israel, somebody from outside Jesus' ministry, somebody from outside all of the people who are connected to him this point, that's the first to recognize who he is and what God is doing in and through him. It's a good sign for the future of the world that this soldier is the first to recognize him. So in the same way, we are invited this morning to stop and stare at the sun. And what do we see with the eyes of faith? The first thing we see is that our shame is sent away. The part of me and the part of you that hides from others for fear of being found out, it's already been found out. It's already been mocked. It's already been born the scorn of all of the watching and the wicked world. All the things within me and within you that are worthy of shame have been imputed to Jesus, and He has borne that shame. He has been treated as the outcast as the reject, and as the dirty sinner. And He has done this for us, and it is done. If you are in Christ, there is no shame left to bear. In Christ, our shame is sent away. Second of all, our death is doomed. Death is doomed. The part of me, the part of you that quivers at the day when our relationship with our body will cease 
the day I sense I'll be separated from the others that I love and they from me, the day that feels like the end of my story, the finality of my final day, it has already been taken into the one who has borne the curse of death. Now Jesus says, even though I die, yet shall I live. Though you die, yet shall you live. In Christ, our death is doomed. This is the gospel. Our shame sent away, our death doomed and conquered. And finally, our cries are answered. The part of me that, that wonders if anyone's listening, the part of you that wonders if you are all alone, the part of you that cries out in fear, seeking a listening ear and a comforting word, and the part of you that needs to be accepted by God rather than rejected by Him, has been already, through the worst of it, in Christ. In Jesus, mankind tasted what it means to be God-forsaken, so that you or I would never have to. If you are in Christ, your cries will ultimately be answered. So just as the ancient Nabataeans were, were able to bring life and, and flourishing from a desert landscape, so we have seen how God can take even the deepest fears and failures of man and through them accomplish His will in perfect fulfillment. And His accomplishment stands today and forever. As we looked at the Christ upon the cross in these verses, we saw how the cross is the place of deepest failure according to man. And yet we saw how, how the cross is the place of deepest fulfillment according to God. And we considered together what it means for us to stop and, and stare at the sun and to say with this soldier, truly, this man is the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your willingness to send your Son. Jesus, we thank you for your willingness to be our sacrifice, to stand in our stead to bear our shame, to experience our death, to undergo our forsakenness. All for our, for our good, Lord, that we may never experience those things permanently, but that they would all be in, our, in the past tense, that in you they are already done. And our destiny is on to light and to glory and to participation and to fullness and to eternal life with you to union with you and with your good creation. Thank you for this hour that we've had together. Uh, we ask that you would impress these truths upon our heart as we go this week. Help us to remember just who you are, what you've accomplished, and what your promises are to us. We love you and we trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.